Yeah, it's so important for us to, uh, sometimes scripture is just right there and we don't see it, we don't understand it. Simeon's prophecy about Jesus is so important that this child will be a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. That's the embodiment to the simplicity of the gospel there. It must contain God's covenant promises to Israel and also the goyim, that is the entire world. The gospel is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Many, You tell that to many Christians and it just right over their heads and it just doesn't land, it doesn't register. But Simeon's prophecy, a light for, it's uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 32, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. There is something very unique about God's faithfulness to Israel and how that works out and how we are called to help participate in that. Well, let, let's stand. We're uh, walking through a, a unique little series here called Heart-Wrenching and Heartwarming Biblical Truth and Fact of Life. How many of you remember when your parents told you the facts of life or the fact I don't know if it, yeah, sometimes parents don't get around to it. They're too busy and they don't know how to, <laughs> how to spell it out. But we're calling this series Heart-Wrenching and Heartwarming Biblical Truth and Fact of Life. Many times uh, we are not told by our spiritual parents that being a Christian means embracing the cross, means uh, following Jesus into very difficult places and making some very challenging decisions that become heart-wrenching, but yet heart-warming. There's that combination of real difficult things, but yet it leads to the ultimate healing and warming of our hearts, if you will. Uh, all, the Bible is just saturated with heart-wrenching, heart-warming, biblical truth and fact of life. And if we're to grow in the Lord and reproduce, we have to know the facts of life and be everything that God has called us to be. Otherwise, we won't bear fruit in difficult seasons that we go through in our lives that are intended to unveil intimacy with the Lord there and true realities coming forth. But stand with me, if you would, um, in, in Luke chapter 2. I trust you, you're sensing God's grace and God's presence with us here. But this important passage, this is part two of our little series. This is Jesus' own pathway of self-discovery. We can see here at age 12 is well underway. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of Pesach, of Passover. Every year he was there, and you know what that meant, uh, studying the Passover lamb, studying the, uh, the redemption of God's people being redeemed from Israel, the, uh, redeemed from uh, Egypt, and the Passover lamb being unveiled. Such an important feast. It is the feast of all feasts in Israel's history, to be sure. So Jesus was very well saturated in these biblical truths. When he was 12 years old, and a bell should go off for every Jew, when he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. And the custom of being 12 years old meant bar mitzvah. Uh, to be sure, that's uh, Jesus' bar mitzvah year where he was learning how to read in Hebrew in the synagogue. They went up to the feast, the Passover feast, according to the custom as Jesus' uh, year of bar mitzvah, becoming the son of the commandment. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it, thinking he was in their company. One text actually says in, his, in the caravan of the family, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among the relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother 
said to him. His mother speaks up frequently. Son, why have you treated us this way? Your father and I, don't you just love that? Your father and I, we're a team here. We're a team. We're always on the same page. Father and I are always on the same page when it comes to you, son. I have been anxiously, your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? He asked the question. Didn't you know I had to be in Abba's house? You feel the earth shake and tremor. But they did not understand what he was saying to them. How many of you have seasons when you don't understand what God is saying to you? You don't understand what Jesus is saying to you. It gets a little bit strange, a little bit mysterious. Then he went down to Nazareth. You realize it's, it's in the south where they are in Jerusalem, and it says he went down. It's because Jerusalem is on a mountain. And whenever you leave Jerusalem, you go down. Whether you go north, south, east, or west, you're heading down because you're on Mount Zion. You're on a mountain. So they go down, and they head, which turns out to be, of course, north, several hundred miles, and they walk back in their caravan back to Natsar, branch town, as it is, of course, understood, where the branch will come. And uh, he was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Uh, Abba, Father, we humble our hearts before you. Lord, we don't under, uh, understand what you're always up to. As a young boy, a 12-year-old boy in your bar mitzvah year, you were being saturated with Scripture. And that day, Aramaic was spoken as the common language, but Jews learned Hebrew, a sister language. And Jesus was being saturated in the Torah in finding simcha, Torah, joy in the Lord, joy in knowing the word of God that liberates and sets the human soul free. And the word becoming flesh was right there before their eyes. Lord, we ask you for this grace of self-discovery. Lord, even as Jesus was becoming fully aware of who he was, grant us the grace of awakening, Lord, even in our age. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. Amen. God bless you. Well, uh, I'm, I've been reading a book here and accompanying this. It's called One Foot in Eden, a Christian Celtic view of the different stages of life. And last week I walked through the chapter on old age and wisdom, and uh, I've gone back to check out one of the earlier chapters on what is called the grace of awakening. When we have seasons and moments in our lives when we are awakened into something that we talk about frequently, I've heard Kevin preach on it, when we are awakened into our purpose and our destiny of who we really are. How many of you know that you took years to find out a bit, bits and pieces of who you really were? And in the discovery process, you could shipwreck your life doing all kinds of dangerous things, whether it was drugs and rock and roll or whatever, or some philosophy or whatever it might be. Um, it's very challenging for us. And uh, in his wonderful teachings, uh, J. Philip Newell, on the grace of awakening, let me just read a little portion here that's uh, so instrumental. The grace of awakening is one of becoming aware of who we truly are and choosing to live out of that truth. That is, letting that truth conform you, letting that truth put you through a fire and transform you. This, listen to this parable here that J. Philip Newell tells. The story of a father trying to wake his son up for school in the morning makes this point. So listen to the cute kind of story here. The son responded to this knocking on his bedroom door by saying, I'm not going to get up. I shall tell you three reasons why I'm not going to get up. The first is because I hate education. The second is because the children tease me. And the third is because education is boring. To this the father replied, 
you are going to get up. And I shall tell you three reasons why you're going to get up. The first is because it is your duty to get up. The second is because you are 45 years old. And the third is because you are the headmaster of the school. <laughs> that is, we all need to wake up to who we really are because we sometimes forget who we are. J. Philip Newell goes on, he says, not only is it an awakening, but a choosing to get up, as it were, or to live according to the truth that has been spoken by the word of God being uttered in us. When we invite the word, Jesus, into us, he starts to utter things, he starts to speak things. As we walked around and we kind of did a little bit of the Torah simcha, touching the Hebrew text and allowing that to, inviting that to get into our souls, into our spirits. It's so important for us to allow that to happen. The grace that enables us to become more aware of who we are is one that can stir also within us the desire to be conformed to that and by that truth. Just as Jesus told the paralyzed man who lay on his bed to stand and walk, stand and walk, so there are creativities within us that have not only been undiscovered, but unused. Did you hear that? Jesus learned how to walk in the creative word of the Father. He says, I only do what I hear the Father telling me. He walked in that creative word. And brothers and sisters, I believe even, uh, how many of you are over 50? Raise your hand real quick. Most of us. Julia, you're saved. <laughs> but there are creatives, creativities within us that have not only been undiscovered, but unused. And in being unused are underdeveloped, if not entirely bottled up. Being aware to a creative depth will be the initial kindling of a fire within us, of a desire to be restored or reconnected to that creativity. The grace of awakening is one that can lead us further and further into the truth of who we really are. Now, just put your hand over your heart right now and say, come alive. Anything dormant inside of me, come alive. Rise from the dead, arise and shine. Brothers and sisters, it is in hearing this word that we will be awakened to what is deepest and truest in us. Friday night, I was sitting there. My sleep schedule was thrown off by this, that, and the other thing. I was feeling really tired. I'm thinking, I have to get up tomorrow morning at 6.30 in order to drive down to Plainfield. I don't want to do that. I think it's time to take a Saturday off. And I'm thinking, how can I do that? There's people showing up for this recording session. I feel so tired, I don't want to go. And then all of a sudden, memory comes and says, this is spiritual warfare. Wake up, wake up, wake up. Awaken to your true purpose. Awaken to your... And then I tell you what I had to do. This is, you have your own story, your own way of, I had to get on my knees and say, Jesus, forgive me for forgetting who I am. I'm in the middle of a recording project and I need to wake up. And I picked up this book and I was reading it and then it came to that section that said, the grace of awakening is one that can lead us further and further into the truth of who we are. And all of a sudden the tears just started flowing. And I'm thinking, I'm getting up tomorrow morning. I am getting up tomorrow morning, no matter what. No matter how I feel, if I feel a cold coming, I am getting up tomorrow morning, no matter what it takes, I'm going to get up. Uh, this time, Dory wasn't going with me because it just wasn't what God was doing. It was a different kind of a session and whatnot. And I was thinking, oh, Lord, if only Dory were coming with me today, I, I wouldn't get lost, and I'd have a companion down there to encourage me. Sometimes I get lost 
you know, and I've got my GPS, and I'm trying to do the GPS. How many of you know that it's nice to have somebody along with you? But it just wasn't what God was doing, and it was like the Lord was saying, this time it's going to be you and me. You're going to be utterly dependent upon me for everything you do in this little juncture, this little drive of an hour and a half away. But I just remembered again, who are you? I received a gift from the Lord years ago. It was the gift of dependency upon the Lord. And the Lord smites me with that gift. It's like sometimes a painful whip comes on my back and says, don't you remember who you are? You can do nothing without me. You can do nothing without me. Nothing without me. And then I remember who I am again. Prayerfully dependent upon Jesus with whom I cannot do anything without him. Nothing. Nothing without him. So, and and I believe that was Jesus' unique experience. This is a Bible that Marilyn Sundley picked up for me. And it's written by a Jewish man. It's called Revealing Jewish Roots in Power, the One New Man Bible. It's got some really, really powerful, good things in it. Let me read to you how it starts off. uh, Luke chapter 2. And the boy Yeshua in the temple. Listen to the text. And his parents were going to Jerusalem from year to year to the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up for the feast according to their custom and for his bar mitzvah. He takes the liberty and the freedom to fill in the blank for those who don't know that a 12-year-old Jewish boy 12 years old is gargantuan because it's your bar mitzvah year. And bar mitzvah literally means son of the commandment or son of the word. So Jesus is being bar mitzvahed into his purpose. The word of God, you realize how many times Jesus would say, it is written, it is written, it is written. And Satan would come at him and say, well, it is written in Psalm 91 that you shall not uh, dash your foot against a stone. And then Jesus would say, it is written. And there would be this sword fight going on. Who's got the proper understanding of the word of God? Jesus initiated that whole experience with the help of his mother and father and the spirit of God by being bar mitzvahed into his purpose. And we need a personal baptism into our own bar mitzvah. And it will mean a lot of unique things, similar to all of us, but then a little bit unique. How many of you know that my fingerprints are my own? Thank you. Lift up your hand. Say, these are my fingerprints. You can't have it. These are unique fingerprints. They're mine and mine alone. A unique identity. But then, how many of you have a right hand, a left hand? How many of you have a head? How many of you have a head? Raise your hand. How many of you have legs? There's a lot of things we have in common, but there's a lot of uniqueness and a lot of distinctiveness to us. The truth of who we are, we come into a personal awakening. In Jesus' bar mitzvah year, That would mean meeting with the rabbi in Nazareth frequently to learn Hebrew, to receive personal instruction, and to see if he understands the word of God. Not only if it's head knowledge. How many of you have seen a lot of people who have great head knowledge but don't have a clue about how to apply it to life? Makes all the difference in the world if you can interpret Scripture accurately and know the biblical languages but then also apply it to life. You can be a seminarian uh, studying and taking an awesome degree and all kinds of things and and be getting, you know, uh, A-plus work, getting what's the highest uh, summa cum laude, right? Isn't that the highest? The the, the highest honor that you can get is student 3.9 or above. But you can have a 3.9, you can have summa cum laude, and your marriage is in shambles. You tell me you understand the word of God? You know how to apply it? Well, maybe you do. Maybe this is a cross in your life. You don't really know, but you can tap into someone's life to find out. But studying Torah, the teaching of Scripture, and learning how to grow in the Lord. Look at Luke chapter 4, just a wee bit away from here. Three times Jesus quotes the word of God in uh, Luke chapter 4. It's also in Matthew chapter 4, of course. 
It is, Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone. I believe Jesus began to know the word of the Lord at that time. Look at verse 8, Luke chapter 4, verse 8. Jesus answered, Satan, it is written, worship the Lord your God only and serve him. And then uh, Satan actually quotes Psalm 91 and says, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. But Jesus says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. It is written. Jesus knows the proper use of the word of God. Not to condemn or to control, but to liberate and to bring healing. This is one of my favorites. Look at Luke chapter 22, verse 37. When the disciples were uh, confused about who Jesus was and about his messianic calling of bearing the sins of the world, he points to Isaiah 53. Look at Isaiah. uh, Well, we won't go to Isaiah 53. Look at Luke chapter 22, verse 37. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. I believe even in those early days of his bar mitzvah year, Jesus would study the scripture and begin to have an awakening of who he was. Begin to have an awakening that he could not be the popular Messiah of fervent expectation, but he was called to be the sin bearing Messiah who was the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. He would study the Word of God, the Word of God would burn in his soul and his spirit. He'd say, That's me, that's me. And he was being awakened by divine revelation into his true destiny, into his true dream, into his true purpose. Tomorrow is Martin Luther King Day. And I believe Martin Luther King was birthed into this awakening process. And let, let me quote one of my favorite quotes of Martin Luther King on something that is not always very popular amongst us as Christians, especially American Christians. In the, uh, the book, The Insanity of God, that, which is about the persecuted church, uh, the suffering church that is persecuted and goes through trial after trial, when Yining Lee spoke that day and shared with us a little bit about growing up in China and the sufferings of the underground church that go on, it, you know, uh, that, that was a unique moment. We had right here a witness Uh, before our eyes of a woman who came to faith in Jesus in the midst of what's going on in China today. It was an incredible moment. Much of the church knows about this suffering Messiah reality. But uh, Martin Luther King writes, and I quote, he says, my personal trials have also taught me the value of unmerited suffering. That is, I, I suffered and I didn't deserve this. This is, wasn't... I did nothing to deserve this. How many of you noticed that this this last week, Dylan Roof was sentenced to death for walking into a Wednesday night? We were talking about this a little bit on Wednesday night at our prayer meeting. Dylan Roof, a white uh, supremacist, walked into a prayer meeting in Charleston, South Carolina, and murdered eight black people in a church. And he was sentenced to death this last week for that 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 crime beyond words. The black people have had to suffer greatly in this nation because of white supremacy and and racism beyond uh, our language today. But he says, my personal trials have taught me the value of unmerited suffering. As my sufferings mounted, I soon realized that there were two ways that I could respond to my situation. Try this on for size. Either to react with bitterness or to seek to transform the suffering into a creative force. Where is he getting his ideas from? Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is a preacher. He studied the word of God. He knows the word of God. 
I decided to follow the latter course that has transformed the suffering into a creative force. I decided to follow the latter course. Recognizing the necessity for suffering, I have tried to make of it a virtue. If only to save myself from bitterness, I've attempted to see my personal ordeals as an opportunity to transform myself and heal the people involved in the tragic situation of racism in this country, which now remains. I have lived these past few years with the conviction that unearned suffering is redemptive. Before that, when Martin Luther King stood before a large group of people and said, I have a dream. He was willing to be transformed and conformed to that powerful vision that God had given him. I have a dream that one day the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racist, with its governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, one day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and little white girls as sisters and brothers. He was willing to be conformed in his life, and transformed by that dream and that vision that God had given him. And he began to reinterpret suffering as redemptive. Jesus had that dream and that vision as well. Jesus was the one that is so consumed. He said, my father's house, the zeal of the Lord came into Jesus' life. And he said, my father's house shall be a house of prayer for all the nations. Irregardless of the color of your skin. All the nations will be welcomed at father's house. All of the nations will be welcomed into father's temple to pray and to be healed. Will we be conformed by that truth? of who we are. We discover who we are, a child of God. Jesus comes into our lives. Jesus comes into our hearts. He is the word of God made flesh. And then he wants to take that truth that he imparts to you to see your family healed, to see your sons and see your daughters healed and, and, and transformed in their hearts to see what their lives can be in the Lord, to see that Jesus comes into your lives to help you, not only to bless you, but to cause you to be a blessing. We are blessed to be a blessing. But will we be conformed by that dream? Will we be conformed by that truth of who we are? Are we willing to become the vision of the Lord? Jesus not only studied the word of God, Jesus not only studied in his bar mitzvah year, but he became the word. It was said of him, the word of God became flesh, dwelt in our midst. Unearned suffering, is it redemptive? Do we become bitter or do we become better? Ask yourself the question. That's unfair, that shouldn't have happened to me. I've been pastoring all these years, and why is this happening to me? What's wrong with the situation here? What's gone wrong? Do I want to become better, or do I want to become bitter? It's your choice. Do I want to let the, the vision of the Lord transform my life? The journey into the truth of who we are, heart-wrenching, heartwarming, we saw that movie, and not everybody likes that movie. Manchester by the Sea. Some people hate that movie. I happen to love it. Because <laughs> it's heart-wrenching, and it's heartwarming. 
And you're not going to really get your heart transformed or warmed unless you're really, unless you're willing to let your heart be wrenched by the realities of life. You can run away, I can run away, but guess what? There's no running away from difficult things in life. Life is difficult. Yes, there, life is filled with mystery, but there's a whole lot of stuff that's pretty clear. You follow the Lord and you're going to have some challenges. You're going to have some troubles. Yesterday at the recording session, there were some real, real unique moments uh, w- with my uh, producer uh, and <clears throat> myself about making some choices. And it was some real, real unique moments. And it was so excellent to meet uh, the bass player But the journey into this truth, heart-wrenching and heartwarming as it is, that must conform and transform us. How many of you have had any unjust suffering in your life? Something has happened to you that's just unfair. We can make the choice, better or bitter. The dream and the vision that Jesus imparts to us, are you willing to become your dream? Signs and wonders are cool. But you have to be a sign and a wonder. How many of you love signs and wonders? God, let the miracles flow. But the God's greatest sign and wonder is when the word becomes flesh in you and I. Just, just three simple things. You, you know, this is, I'm preaching in the choir here in a sense. Um, some simple truths that will cran- transform and conform us to the truth. Number one, listening to the word that is forever speaking. It is in hearing this word about who we are, what our awakening to ourselves, who we really are in the Lord. It is in hearing this word that we will be awakened to what is deepest and truest in us, in hearing this word. Remember what Jesus says about the good shepherd. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. His sheep follow him because they know his voice, and they will not follow the voice of a stranger. Brothers and sisters, so much of what life is about, it's learning to listen, learning to hear the voice of the good shepherd. Because if you know his voice, even if you go into fiery trials, if you go into painful situations, God, you know that God can redeem it. He can transform it. If you know the voice of the good shepherd there. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just put your hand on your heart right now. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I want to know you better. I want to know what you're saying to me right now about who I am. Let me hear this word deep in my soul. For you say, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. I just finished Haddon Robinson's book, on the Lord is my shepherd, just totally enjoyed it, just was immersed in reading this book. We'll have to get some extra copies of that in the new year here. But Had Robinson talked about the intimacy that the good shepherd has with his sheep and that he gives them all personal names, unique little names to, uh, according to their character, you know, ones that stray off. There's a tragic moment as I was reading the book about what the good shepherd will do because he loves his sheep so much. For a sheep that is continually wandering away and putting himself in danger, he will purposely break the leg of the sheep. He will break the leg of the sheep, is what I said. And then he will carry the sheep around on his shoulders. And then when the broken leg heals... That sheep has finally discovered the intimacy, the joy of the good shepherd. He has gotten to know the voice of the good shepherd. He was running away from him all the time, running away in the hills and and all over the place. But now he's learned the warmth, the intimacy of the good shepherd's love for him. And he's become certain. And the shepherd will give that sheep a, a 
special name because he had to learn through fiery trials. Sometimes the presence of pain doesn't mean, uh, how many of you have read The Shack? William P. Young writes in The Shack, the presence of pain does not indicate the absence of love. Often pain is present because of love. When Jesus broke the leg or when a shepherd breaks the leg of a sheep, you think that leg hurt? Do you think a broken leg? Justin Smith, how many broken legs have you had, dude? Two, two broken legs. Do you remember the excruciating pain? Remember before I went to Korea, you drew a picture of yourself with a broken leg. The next day I was going to Korea, you had broken your leg at the day before I left for Korea, and you drew me a picture of you and your broken leg so I wouldn't forget that you were home with a broken leg. That broken leg caused a lot of pain. And from the birthing experience, Justin is sitting there going, yeah, he's crying and screaming, he's white knuckles. And I forced my little finger into his fist, said, Justin, it's okay. It's okay. And then all of a sudden, a screaming baby stopped screaming, and he started to listen to the voice of his father. But it's unforgettable moments, unforgettable moments of intimacy, unforgettable moments. This morning when, when we prayed together, I remembered those moments. I was flashing back to the broken leg. I was flashing back to the day you were born and the three of us were there on the table together. You know, it was just incredible moments. But the Lord wants to develop in the midst of the pain that we go through, this intimate connection that we have so that there will be a bond. And that's why I like the movie Manchester by the Sea, is I see a young father who goes through unbelievable brokenness and pain and sorrow. Uh, his brother died. Oh, no, I'm not going to do the spoiler. How many of you have not seen the movie? Okay, I will, I'll stop right there. It's a real movie. And Beverly Hospital is right in the movie there, the real Beverly Hospital. That's not a spoiler, trust me. But we have to learn how to let the word conform us. Let this word come into us. Let Jesus speak to you. You will get to know him. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. It was, I was visiting Tom. Sorry, I have to give you a dollar for using you as an illustration. Tom and uh, Mitch and I were praying for Tom in the hospital. It was Wednesday a couple weeks ago. And we were praying for you, and you, I thought you were nodding off into a little bit of a sleep. But then you, you woke up and you said, don't worry, it's not my time yet. It, it, it just cleared the air with all fear and all anxiety about you going home right now. It says, don't worry, it's not my time yet. And it's just, oh, okay, I just needed to know that. It's okay. <laughs> that word came into my heart and my soul. But uh, uh, the second point after the word, real quick here. Meditation, reflection is so important. Mary was so good at this. You mothers are very good at these kinds of things as well. Look at <clears throat> the boy Jesus in the temple. Look at verse uh, 51 of Luke chapter 2. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. She learned how to ponder and, and just go back. Look at it. This is repeated in the text here. Look at Luke chapter 2, verse 19. It's twice this is underlined. Luke 2, 19. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Twice. It's in Luke chapter 2, verse 19, and also in Luke chapter 2, verse 51. Mary was a woman who meditated upon life's situations. She learned how to unplug and treasure things in her heart that were going on in life and say, this is the treasures of life going on before my eyes. Yes, there's some pain. There's heart-wrenching things. Here's, moments ago, she was, she was saying, what's wrong with you? Your father and I have been searching for you. And all of a sudden, everything is turned around and she's treasuring these painful moments in her heart because that's putting the stamp on her of who she is in, in the years to come. Jesus is suffering. In Joshua 1 and, and Psalm 1, Psalm 1 says, On his Torah I meditate day and night. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8 
uh, Dory bought a, a really cool uh, cup with this on it. Joshua is the first book of the prophets, believe it or not, in the Hebrew order of the Bible. But it's so important. Do not let this book of the law, the Torah, the teachings in the book of Genesis, do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. Remember the story of Joseph. Remember the story of Abraham. And that you will be careful to put these things into practice. Then you will prosper. You will be successful. Have not I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. We have to learn how to meditate upon his word. Yesterday I came to the recording session and I was wearing my inferiority. I was wearing my shirt of inferiority. And I was saying, now, when you guys hear my singing, please don't be too turned off. Uh, I just sound terrible when I sing. And then Marco, the the producer, says, Scott, we've got a telephone number for you here. It's called uh, the number for inferior vocalists. You call up and you whine and you complain about how you do not like the sound of your voice. And everybody goes, wah, 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 and they all hang up on you. And I thought that was, I was on the floor laughing. He, I just needed to hear that in those moments. And then we started to get into the music, and I forget, if that's the voice God has given me, thank you, Jesus. Victory won for one more moment until the next day, right? But uh, the hotline for inferior vocalists. So I've, I said, where is that number anyway? <laughs> oh, so we have to learn how to treasure what God is doing in our lives. But number one, the word, let the word speak in you. Let God speak his word, the scripture, into your heart, your spirit, and let God speak words into your life. Um, Number two, learn how to meditate and reflect upon what's going on. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord. Look into the beauty of the night sky. Look into the beauty of of a January day like this. It's glorious. It's beautiful. Learn how to meditate and reflect upon creation and God's word. Number three, the last simple point here is, is prayerfulness as total dependency. Phyllis was playing for us today. Uh, sweet hour of prayer, the wonderful old hymn, one of Iris' favorites, as she commented. But prayerfulness is a total dependency. Jesus' passionate vision for the practice of the house of prayer. Johnny Erickson Tata, God spoke to her one day and said, my gift to you is your dependency upon me. Are you willing to allow God to smite you with a holy dependency? Are you willing to allow God to come into your life and make you so humbly dependent upon him that you can do nothing without him? Mark 135, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, he left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. As Jesus was coming into his self-awareness of who he was called to be, I believe there were moments long before Gethsemane when he said, oh, no, not my will, but your will be done. Oh, no, God, Isaiah 53, this is me? And eventually it got to the place in his life where he said, this must be fulfilled in me. This must be fulfilled in me. And it became his bread, it became his passion. But I believe also there were these moments when he said, Father, if there's any other way, if there's any other way, if there's any other way, but nonetheless, let your will be done. I believe he prayed that prayer many times leading up to Gethsemane. Not my will, but thy will be done. Prayerfulness as total dependency when you're facing heart-wrenching but yet heart-warming realities in your life. Paul learned to say, pray without ceasing. Personal dependency through prayer. And that doesn't mean that you have to set a time where you are praying an hour every day or anything. It means that you pray your way through your life. As Keith Green said, make my life a prayer for you. I want to do what you want me to. Let your whole life become a prayer. I just have to pray my way through every day. Through every second, through every moment, pray without ceasing. Yes, have appointed times of prayer, but just walk your way through your life in prayer. And that's the essence of my father's house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. Last year when we were in Jerusalem and Dory and I went to the wall 
I still have the brochures, the Western Wall, and the one that says, for my house will be a house of prayer for all people. And we walked up to the wall, and Dory was praying on the woman's side, and I was praying on the men's side. Spirit of God did something in us, uh, but it's going to be the essence of who we are, who you are. Prayerfulness as total dependency. Jesus' passionate vision, practice of the house of prayer. God will give you, he will give me that gift of dependency and renew that in us to help us to discover fully who we are. How many of you feel that you, you need to discover more of who you are? Just raise, raise your hand with me. How many of you need to say, I need to fully know who I am? Dory has a book by Graham Cook, Discovering Your Prophetic Gifting. I believe there are people in our church who have a prophetic gifting that has not been fully developed yet to who knows what God wants to do with you. Amazing things. Just uh, stand with me. This is going to take a battle stance. Take your stand against the devil's scheme. It's real easy to raise your hand, of course, in a church setting and then walk out and then turn around and do things that you shouldn't be doing or saying or, uh, oh, my terrible voice. <laughs> Dear God, have mercy. But Lord, just put your hand over your heart and your head and maybe your mouth too for the things that you say. Abba, Father, we just uh, follow me in this prayer and put it in your own words. Abba, Father, please awaken in me who I truly am and help me to step outside of the box that the enemy has put me in. For it is written... I will trust in the Lord with all of my heart. I will lean not upon my own understanding. I will acknowledge you and know you in all my ways. And you will direct my paths in this year. I will meditate upon your word. I will meditate upon your promises. Even as you speak your word into me. You are my good shepherd. You know me. And I want to know you better. I want to hear your voice speaking in me. I want to hear your word reverberating in my soul. Help me to take a stand against the devil's schemes. Even as I am standing now, I take a stand against the devil's schemes. Help me to be a witness in this generation. A fearless witness in this generation. I will not be ashamed to share the gospel. No matter where I am, in my home, in my workplace, uh, amongst my friends, I will not be ashamed to be a witness for you, Jesus. So, Lord, we bless your name. Let your word burn in my heart. Give me the grace to treasure the things that you are doing. Treasure them in my heart for my son's sake or my daughter's sake or my neighbor's sake, or my, my, someone's that you're wanting me to reach out to. Teach me, Lord, your, your word. But we bless one another now, and I just want you to reach out and bless the next person. Lord, we bless one another for awakening to who we really are, awakening to what is deepest and truest in each and every one of us. Wake up! Awakening in Jesus' name. Awakening in Jesus' name. Wake up to what is deepest and truest in you. Do not believe the lie. God's grace will be sufficient for you. His power will be perfected in your weaknesses. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. In the name of Jesus. Blessed be your name. Lord, come and do that work in us, O Lord. Release us, Lord, to be all that you've called us to be in the name of Jesus. Release us, Lord, in the name of Jesus. And everyone said amen. 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 God bless you.